everyone, and thank you for joining us today. How you think your heirs will inherit may not actually happen the way you think it will. We've been introduced to a product which is able to give us an accurate picture of what your estate will look like on your death and the problems and issues you one may encounter, as well as the opportunity to rectify these issues while you're still alive. As our front first slide says, don't ever guess the maths and the law. Presenting today is someone you all know very well. For those who don't know her, Di Hayden has been with Robert Cowan Investments for 30 years. She's involved in all aspects of the business, has been involved in the lives of most of our clients for four generations, and has her finger on the pulse for all things restructuring and estates related. Di will be joined today by Sine Schwim of Wealth Succession. Sine is a lawyer who specializes in fiduciary law, that involves everything trust, estates, and estate planning related. She's been integral in developing this product and also works closely with RCI on our clients' estates and trusts work. The topics that we will be discussing today will be explaining your family photo, what your estate actually is, the basic principles and considerations to take into account regarding your will, costs you need to consider in your estate, the estate timeline, the awesome My l and product, and finally, we'll be going through three scenarios with you to show you how the My l and product works. Over to you, Sine. Thank you so much, Kate. So yes, before we dive into what your estate looks like, where your assets are situated, how, how wealthy you are, we thought we'd just social some manners and take a look at your family photo first. We need to fully understand who you are. And in order to, to, in order to know who you are, we need to plan to protect your family when you are no longer here. So if we're looking at who you are, we first have to look at your primary relationship, your spouse. So that would entail whether you are single, divorced, or widowed, or if you are married. And if you are married, whether you're married in community of property, out of community of property, with or without accrual. Then we want to know where you come from, your parents. Is it possible that you are probably possibly providing to the maintenance of your parents? And should you no longer be here, we need to plan how to continue to take care of them. Or possibly it can be that you will receive an inheritance from your parents. And we would like to know where that inheritance should be parked so that it optimally continues to grow and preserve the family wealth. Then finally, where's your family growing to? Your children or your grandchildren, depending on their age, their abilities or possible disabilities and where they are situated in the world. We need to understand all of this so that we know how to do a holistic family global wealth plan for you. And then once we know who you are and we've got a better idea of your family, we need to see a 360 degree view of your assets worldwide. All of the, all your assets falls into one of four asset silos. You'll have your assets in trust, then you'll have your assets in companies or close corporation, as you can see there in silo three, and then you'll have your pension and life insurance products or assets. But today we will focus on the assets in your private estate, both locally and offshore. And you need to keep in mind that different rules, laws, and documentation govern each of these asset silos. And for today's discussion of your estate, we're going to focus on how your will should read. And to get to that point, we're going to build your My Living l and Di, would you mind taking us through what assets would typically be in or out of your estate? Sure. So just before I go on to the next slide, just to point out that we do know that we've been through this several times. And we're just giving you a very high level bit of background before we get into the detail, which is the more exciting part. The really exciting part are the last few slides. So please just bear with us. It's always good to remind ourselves how these things work. So let's move on now to your estate. And your estate is things in your own name, as you should know by now after all the times we've said that. So what is in your estate is anything you own in your own name. But in addition to that, it's any debt you may have that will be in your name. And what is not in your estate, and this is not an exclusive list, there's far more than this, but just to give you an idea, 
What is not in your estate is anything that is not in your name. And in addition to that, I put spouse's assets there because they may be or may have an impact on your estate that you're not aware of. Uh, retirement products are excluded from your estate for estate duty purposes, but they are actually still an asset that we need to count as being part of your estate, but excluded for estate duty. So moving on from there, now we know what your estate is, and over the years you accumulate a huge amount of wealth, obviously. Uh, when do you need a will? You need a will when you have assets, so when you buy a house, even if you've got a car, if you want to leave it some, to somebody, that's an asset. But more importantly, it's when you have all those important people in your life, and in particular, your next generation. Why do you need the will? To leave your assets as you see fit to the people you want to leave it to. Uh, unfortunately, that works well in South Africa and a lot of other jurisdictions. But just so that you know, we're coming across a lot of forced airship issues, which we'll go into a bit later on as people become more and more global. So the basic principles in your estate. We need to count what's in your estate. We need to count the assets and we also, so those are the positives and we need to count the liabilities, which are the negatives, which would be things like a bond. Uh, we've got to look at all the worldwide assets. Doesn't matter where you're living, whether you're resident here, you're resident in another country. We have to count everything. And we have to be well aware of where the asset is situated. So that's what CITUS is. CITUS is the jurisdiction where the asset is. And that has a huge impact on wills. And it might mean that you need more than one. What's excluded from uh, your estate and so it doesn't need to be mentioned in your will, assuming you've, you've got your beneficiary set up properly, are retirement products. Legal contracts are very important, and it's one of the things that we forget. You might have a partnership which has got a legal agreement. Your marital regime, as we pointed out, is very important, and Sine will go into more detail. Uh, you might have a sale of share agreement that needs to have attention paid to in case you're not around when the shares get sold et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, with any estate, estate, whether you're alive or you're not alive, but we're talking more now about after death, there are costs and there is tax. You cannot get away from the tax. It's a case of looking at it and seeing if one can improve it. So just to go run through this very quickly, you do get an exemption in South Africa of three and a half million rand which means that you don't pay a state duty on that. Uh, in addition to that, if you leave all your assets to your wife or a portion or to your husband, a portion of that, a portion of the estate, you get what's called a spousal rollover and that estate duty exemption rolls over to them. So on their death, there's 7 million rand. And then the biggie, but before we get to the biggie, which is estate duty, please remember there's capital gains tax to pay before estate duty. So one also needs to be cognizant of that. Cognizant of that. Estate duty, anything over three and a half million is going to be taxed at 20% up to 30 million, 25% on assets over 30 million. So the richer you are, the more the receiver gets. And then the last point is we've got executor's fees that are charged in an estate. And the statutory amount laid down uh, in the government gazettes is three and a half percent of the value of the estate. What we're going to show you now does allow for that fee to come down. And Kate's going to run through once we've done all this, what the advantages are, but you can negotiate that fee. And that is an important point to take into account. Right, so that's the costs. Then you've got your will. What is it that you have to put in your will? You have to appoint an executor. I'm just going to run through this very quickly. We can go into detail with it if you want to chat to us. You've obviously got to have somebody you're leaving the money to. Those are your heirs. You might set up a trust. So then you've got to think about who are going to be the trustees in that trust. And then you've got the assets, which you don't have to mention in the will, but you do have to know what they are. 
So you've got an idea of, of what there is to leave to whom. Then very, very importantly, please, please consider your family circumstances. Where are all your children? Especially as they get older and they move around the world, it's making life very complicated. And the sooner you get a handle on what the complications are, and perhaps even sort them out before they leave South Africa, the better. Then obviously you've just got to be aware of what the tax consequences are going to be of and where all your assets are and what extra tax or extra points we need to take into account if your assets are sitting in other jurisdictions. So then once you've done all that, you've now counted everything and you've set your will up and then you die. What happens then? So there's a whole timeline, and I'm going to, as I said, run through it quickly so we don't spend too much time on this section. And this is where it becomes very important. I presume you all know what a liquidation and distribution account is, but if you don't, what it means is that all the assets, all the liabilities are counted up, the estate duty is calculated, once all that's done, a document is produced called a liquidation and distribution account that goes to the master. And the master is the one who looks at that and says, okay, well, yes, we can wind up the estate, or no, we can't, and you've got to do more or whatever. So this is how the process goes. Someone dies, there's a ceremony, and then the death certificate has to be produced. Nothing can happen until we've got the death certificate. The executor who's appointed in the will appoints an administrator. The estate is frozen. We can go through how long we've been through it before, but it's not for the whole time that the estate is being wound up. It's only until the master issues the letters of executorship. And one important point here, please, please make sure that whatever's on record at Home Affairs is up to date and correct. Because what we're finding happens is that your spouse may die, but your, your ID records still show you're married. That's a problem. And we then have to go back to home affairs. And all these things, as you know, take a long time so that the death certificate reflects your correct status. That's just a little tip along the way. Okay. Then the executor gives a power of attorney to the administrator to wind up the estate. And the administrator does this very important job of gathering everything and putting it into this liquidation and distribution account. Now, if there are any problems, we don't know until that point. So what we're going to show you today is why it's a good idea. Instead of leaving the liquidation and distribution account to be produced right at the end when you're not here, I mean, not quite sure what the intention was, but it's now worked out not quite how you were planning. We want to do the liquidation and distribution account at the front of this process. And that will speed up the winding up of the estate and the distribution of the assets to all of you. So that is, we've now done the high level look. We're now, I'm now gonna hand over to Sine. It's a product that we're looking at. It's something where everything's fed into a program and after much careful thought and planning, the liquidation and distribution account is produced. So Sine is going to tell you exactly what it does. Over to you, Sine. Thank you, guys. Yes, from what you just said, I can add that as a state administrators, our team over years of practice always get to the liquidation and distribution account as it goes to the master's office at the end of an estate administration process. And nine out of 10 times we look at it and we tell each other, oh no, if only this client had done this or that differently or moved these one or two things into different buckets or paperwork in order, then the whole thing could have been so much different for the family and so much more beneficial for the family in the long run. And after experiencing that for years and years, our team got together and said, we have to bring it to the front of the row. And hence the My l &D was born. So the My l d is a very powerful planning tool in which we bring the future into the present so that that only person that's able to do something about it, that's now the estate owner or the client, 
still very much young and alive and healthy, can come in and fix the complexities that can be solved ahead of his passing so that by the time we get to the deceased estate scenario, we are in a constant state of readiness to just finalize and go through the statutory process. And then, of course, we don't like guessing the maths. We often get clients that think that they've got an estate of a certain size that in their minds they can more or less say, this is the slices of cake that I want to leave to my loved ones. Just to find out at the end of the day that the cake wasn't that big because you have to take all of these costs and taxes into account. And as we'll show later on when we go through some of the scenarios, that then often means that the will cannot be executed in the way that the then deceased person wanted it to do. So what we now say is we don't guess maths, we actually do it and we run through it in scenarios to see exactly in terms of rant and sense how everything works out. And then only we put your will to the test. We look how the figures and the descriptions and the location of the assets play out in terms of the wording of your will. And um, then we're able to see whether it's successful or not and then decide to redraft the will or make amendments to it. If you then look at the benefits that the My LND can present or the highlights that it gives you, one of the biggest things, um, Di, if you can just move on there for us for a second, thank you, is the scenario planning. Um, we look at all these different scenarios. What if, because the whole theme of the My LND is what if that we've now brought into the present. So what if you are the first dying spouse? What if you are the surviving spouse and how are you going to be taken care of? What if you leave everything to trust or an offshore trust or leave everything to your children or perhaps surprise everything and leave everything to your neighbor? What if, what if, what if? And we run these figures through all of these possible scenarios. And then, of course, we get creative with planning tools and, and involve advisors where needed to say, well, let's put another what if in there. If only we move this asset into that trust or this or that or the following what the difference can be in tax and costs and expenses. So that's a big highlight of the My LND is we take you through possibilities. And once we come to the absolute perfect solution for you and your family, then only do we draft the will. Then, of course, the My LND points out pitfalls. One of the biggest things that is really so often overlooked, like you said, Di, is the marital regime. If you're married you're in South Africa, you're married in terms of one of three possible marital regimes. If you're married in community of property, it means that you didn't have enter into any contract at the time of your marriage. And both spouses contribute all of their assets and liabilities into one basket of assets, and they now jointly own that one basket. And very often people think if I'm married in community of property, I'm the easy one. Um, out of the three options, we're married the easy one. We're married in one bucket. But keep in mind that when a deceased estate falls open and you're married in community of property, the assets of the spouse that's still alive and needs to go on with life during this long process that it takes to finalize an estate is also immediately thrown into the deceased estate which means that the executor needs to take control over those assets, fees and taxes, and everything is calculated on what everything that's in this one bucket. And there needs to go some planning into it to see that that surviving spouse is taken care of for the duration of that process where everything has now suddenly come to a standstill and needs to be run through this legal process. Then as a second matrimonial property um, regime is being married out of community of property. This is the, 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 the normal one where you go for a contract where you say, each of us retain our own basket of assets and we keep it to ourselves and we don't have any interest in each other's basket of assets. And then, of course, the more complicated one is the third option. If you're married out of community of property, so we still each have our own basket of assets, but now we throw in accrual. Accrual means that this spouse that during the course of the marriage had grown their basket more than the other spouse has to then share the difference in that growth from the commencement of the marriage to the end of the marriage with the surviving spouse. And normally that is 50-50, but it can be, it can differ from, from case to case. 
Um, and that's also something that's often forgotten about because it can very much happen that you are the spouse with a larger estate, but your surviving spouse with a smaller estate passed away and you now have to pay over effectively almost half of your net worth to go into that now deceased estate. And let's say it's a him, her situation. She now passed away and her will didn't take this into account. You, the, the man in this scenario, would have to sacrifice half of your net worth for it to be then dealt with in terms of the will. So little things like that can really create some uncomfortable, awkward situations for a family. Then, of course, there's different other pitfalls highlighted by the My LND, such as a predeceased or a divorced spouse. In a divorce situation, you still might have maintenance obligations towards your ex-spouse, and we need to plan for that. And of course, more often than not, um, in, in the people in this room right now, it becomes norm for South Africans to have family members all over the world. All the children are, are abroad, and how the taxes and receipts of inheritance and trust benefits are dealt with in all these different countries differ greatly from each other and how they are treated needs to be taken into account here when we deal with your will as a South African. So that can create a complexity or a pitfall, but it can be addressed through this process. And then, of course, the forced airship, which we will go through a little bit later in one of our scenarios, but people often forget that those very nice, idyllic, romantic holiday homes that we buy in nice countries, Spain and Mauritius and all the exotic nice places, often have forced airship regimes, which means that the state tells you how you're going to deal, how they're going to deal with this upon your passing. They don't even look at your will. So um, a certain portion of a property is prescribed how it will devolve at your passing, on your passing. And then there's a small, a small, a small percentage or portion of it that you can decide. Um, and that can create some complexities. Of course, if you have a business, you've got business partners and they might be buy and sell agreements, key man policies, agreements um, with your partners as to what should happen to a business once you pass away. And everything needs to be taken into account so that we don't end up, um, you know, hurting your business. That still effectively is your family's inheritance. Then going back to those four silos, it's very possible that you have loan accounts pointing in and out of your estate from a trust or a company or a family friend. Um, and all of this needs to be taken into account. And then finally, you cannot look at this without looking at those four silos of your assets. While we are focusing on the estate silo today and when we do the My l &D, it is all interactive and that needs to be taken into account along with that family photo of yours. Okay, so now we're looking at what the l &D covers. We've made it very simple. An l &D account that's produced for the master is actually quite long and complicated, but we don't need to go into that kind of detail now. But what your liquidation and distribution account and what this particular product does, it counts the assets and the liabilities. We all know what those are now. It then looks at what things you have to pay. What is it that has to be paid out of the estate? What's actually left? Who's going to get what? And is there going to be a cash problem or not? And that basically is what we're going to run through now. We've got three scenarios. Uh, they are similar but different. So let's start with scenario one, and you'll see the different effect of what's going on. So scenario one, and they, they are all the same. The husband has popped off first, and he leaves everything to his wife. Married out of community of property with accrual. And you'll see what the effect of that is. So when Joe dies, these are his assets. And I'm sure you know exactly what we're talking about here. They don't need any explanation. There's a total of 26 million, except for the living annuity. And you might wonder why we've put that in there. And I'd like Sine just to run through that so you understand why we've put it in this particular scenario. Yes, a living annuity, if we just look at Joe's assets here, he's got a total estate of 26 million. 
And that could have been his estate. And remember, as we'll go through, costs and taxes are mostly worked out on the assets an individual has as a date of death. So for Joe here, we've got 26 million. A living annuity is, for a, a quick example, to show that we can bring his estate down by 10 million just by looking into the product and making sure that it's set up correctly. We all know, and like you said earlier, pension funds and um, live, um Retirement annuities are all automatically excluded from your estate. But with a living annuity, there's a little catch. You need to make sure that you have a nominated beneficiary on it. If you do, then yes, it falls out of your estate. And if Joe had his nominated beneficiary in place, his estate would have only been 16 million rand and the costs and taxes would have been in that line with that. So yes, a living annuity is not a stock standard entry, but it's something that we just need to check and just make sure that the paperwork is in order. Okay, thanks so much, Sine. So there are our assets of 26 million. And one looks at it and thinks, well, you know, if it wasn't left to the wife, there'd obviously be a state duty to pay here um, based on the amount of the assets, 26 million. We're going to deduct three and a half million and it's going to be taxed at 20 percent on the balance. Don't do the sums because it's not going to work out like that. But that's one, one, what one would assume. Yeah. So then we've got costs. And that big cost there is actually the executor's fee. And that is the main cost in this estate. There are a lot of slightly smaller costs. Um, you've got to submit documents to the master and there's a cost attached to that, et cetera, et cetera. But that is the only cost that we've got on the, in the, this estate. So what is it next? What have we got to pay? And here comes a curveball that many people don't realize is actually happening. So what we've got to pay is the accrual that is owed to Jane because she's married to Joe. And what's happened here is Joe's estate is worth 26 million. Jane's estate is worth 5 million because you've got to count it. And under the accrual system, you've got to balance it out. And it's because of that balancing out that Jane, who has the lower value in her estate, actually gets 9.9 .9 million from the estate before you've looked at any of the assets, before you've looked at who's inheriting, she has the first claim. So Sine, have I said enough? Is there anything you want to add there? 100% die. And as we'll see now on the next slide also is that luckily in scenario one, that Jane is the residual heir, meaning the will said, I leave everything to my wife. So yes, she gets her accrual claim, but luckily because she gets everything else, it's, it's, it's more of the same, you know, it doesn't make a big difference. So if you look on that slide, we'll, we'll, we'll show you that of the 26 million, after the accrual claim has been paid, there's only 14 million, let's call it 15 million rand left to distribute. This is now the first time that we look at the will. So now, like I said, luckily in scenario one, everything goes to Jane. Um, but that is the example of what I also said, we don't want to guess the maths because we thought we had 26 to deal with, but we don't. We only have 15 million to deal with. And then if you look there at the tab that says who gets what, we know Jane is going to get the house and then she's going to get all those investment products that we spoke about. But in order to get that, if we don't want to sell the house, don't want to sell the shares, there's going to be a shortfall of 11 million rand, which Jane, as the sole heir to the estate, will have to pay in in order to get the house and the investments and everything. Luckily, yeah, that 11 million rand cash shortfall is made up out of the, uh, did we say it's nine, just, uh, just, around, just under 10 million rand that Jane is going to get. So because she is the, the claimant and the residual heir, we might not have to sell off too much. But this can be a problem if we're at a time in, in, the, in global economies, we're selling a share portfolio, selling off unit trust, so even putting a holiday home up for mark, in the market can, can meet, will, will force the family or the executor to sell at way below market value if, if the timing is just not perfect. And it can possibly also delay the estate if we have to put fixed properties up for sale. So yes, the big thing that comes out here is that we've got a major cash shortfall, but luckily because Jane is the sole heir, she's able to, I want to say, restructure how the sum has come up with. 
Okay, so moving on to scenario two, yes. which is the same pot of money, but we have a different heir. Mm -hmm. So the husband now decides he's going to leave everything to a trust because he wants to make sure it's going to stay in trust that Jane's not going to spend it and it's going to be left there for her and for his children. Again, married out of community of property with the accrual system. Again, the same pot of assets, the 26 million. And there we've got costs again of 1.1 million. I'm going to run through this very quickly because it's the same. We've got the claim for Jane still. Mm -hmm. So he thinks he's leaving 26 million or take the living annuity off the 14 million, whatever it yeah. is, to the trust. But he's not. <laughs> because Jane is taking the first 9.9, .9, 10 million in the scenario. So what does that do? So what is left? Well, now we've only got 12.6 million left because it's going to a trust. There's now a state duty to pay. And there again, you've got the assets, as Sine has just explained. We've still got Apple Street. We've still got the shares, unit trust, holiday home. We've got a bigger cash shortfall. And we do now need to raise some money because we've got costs to pay of 1 million rand and we've got a state duty of 2.2 million rand. We're not commenting. We're not saying you shouldn't leave it to the trust. We're just here showing you the consequence and what we then have to manage in terms of winding up in a state and what cash has to go to various places. Anything else, Sine, or are we all right on that one? We're good, Dar. I just want to add that we can see that a state duty payable there is 2.2 million rand, whereas where we left everything to Jane, it was zero rand. There's no estate duty payable when you leave any, everything to your spouse or for the portion of assets that you leave to your spouse. So immediately scenario two may look less optimal, but we have to keep in mind that as a family, we only want to pay estate duty once if we have to. We probably will have to at some point. So to, to use a tool where your assets, either at the death of the first time or the survivor or other opportunities along the way, is transferred to the family trust. Even if you have to rip off the band aid and pay the 2.2 million rand estate duty, is not necessarily a bad thing because we do, if we left it to Jane, okay, if we left it to Jane, no estate duty would have been payable. But if we left it to the children directly, then once they pass away, they're going to pay estate duty on it again, including all of the assets that they've accumulated during the remainder of their lives, their working lives and building on this family wealth. So yes, like you said, we're not saying that don't go to trust. We're actually saying go to trust depending on the unique situation of your family structure and the unique situation of the type of assets that you hold, there may be more and less beneficial options. But as a family and as a family around this table, we have to agree to one another. We're not paying estate duty twice where we could have gotten away with only paying it once at the least amount possible. Um, possible. So, so just to give you an idea of how the sums work out on that, uh, we've done lots of uh, scenarios on this, but if you put money into trust instead of being an own name mm -hmm. and then the first generation dies after 30 years, there's not that much difference in the assets. Um, but at the end of the 30-year period, the person who's got the assets in their own name dies, you pay a state duty. And the effect is for the second generation. So we did all the calculations and then the second generation died off 30 years later. The assets in the trust, bearing in mind, trusts are not subject to estate duty. Correct. Very important to establish that because people do get confused. So the assets in the trust, based on the same variables, the same growth rates, same fees, et cetera, et cetera, grow by 23 times. The assets in own name after two sets of estate duty only grew by 11 times. And that I think that Yeah. No, I agree. No, that makes a major difference. And that is the idea of families when we go back to that family picture to say, let's look at it holistically for generations to come. How are we going to preserve this money? 
and then also grow and grow and grow on it. And every time we have it in own name, we're just giving some, we, I always love how my colleague Louis Fenzer always says, we don't want Saj to be an air in our estate. Saj is not an air in my estate. And that is what we're trying to reach legally and safely. <laughs> okay, so so now we're going to come on to scenario three. And please, please don't, don't, we don't want to lose you now. This is the most exciting bit because it's the most complicated. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I hope we've made it simple enough so that it makes sense. But Joe has now lived for a very long time and he's now accumulated a huge amount of wealth and he's still leaving everything to his wife. And he's obviously still married to the same wife, married out of community of property with a crew. So Jane is now set to inherit this pot of 114 million altogether. You can see the assets have changed. I'm just going to run through them because it's very important. So our fixed property of 50 million, they've kept their very their home here, uh, the size it's always been. They haven't done too many improvements. It's still valued at 5 million rand because property hasn't done well in South Africa. But they decided that they wanted to have a property in Spain. Why not? <laughs> so they rushed off and they bought a property in Spain and that now has grown to a value of 45 million. So suddenly we've got a lot more property. We've got personal assets. He's got his cars. Uh, we've got the living annuity. We're still in there. Uh, cash, he's, he's got cash now of 8 million. But he has been very clever, uh, Joe, because he now has put money into trusts. So he's also lent his son some money, which very lucky for the son, 13 million rand. He's put money into an offshore trust of 7 million rand, and this is where it begins to count. So just please bear in mind, as we've got their loans still form part of your estate, loans to trust, loans to companies, loans to very lucky family friend, got 31 million, whatever it is, that's still part of your estate. But the growth, and I'm talking about the trust now, the growth in the trust is not subject to estate duty. All that's subject to estate duty is that loan. So he's been very clever in transferring a whole lot of wealth into the trust, but we're not looking at that at the moment. He's got these loans that are also assets. So there we have 114 million rands worth of assets. You do the sums and you think, oh, there's going to be a huge amount of estate duty if it hadn't all been left to Jane. But we've got a whole lot of curveballs coming your way. So please just bear with us and concentrate on what we're saying. So the costs have now gone up to 9 million rand, which is a lot more. Yeah. And that, Sine is just going to explain. Sine, won't you give us the two big costs that we're counting there in the 9 million? Yes, so we've got a couple of small small costs with regards to the administration of an estate, but there's also the big ticket items that we need to pay attention to. And the first is executor's fees. Like you said at the beginning, Di, executor's fees are charged at 3.5% on the total value of a person's assets as at date of death. But this is negotiable, and that should be negotiated. So, in general, it's negotiable, but for, for purposes of the My Island Deed, it's very important to understand that if a client or a family goes through this exercise of running these scenarios, doing their homework, providing the documentation, allowing us to check everything, that one of the biggest benefits of the My Island Deed is to bring that executive's fees way down, and we're going to review your My Island Deed annually so that we see, okay, now you've sold the house in Spain, now you no longer have have that loan account or that loan to Sunny or whatever the case may be. And by actively working on this account year after year, the client and the family is doing most of the job of the estate administration ahead of time. And also, like Kate will explain to us later, all of this speeds up the process, which means the fee should be taken, should, should reflect this. So executive's fees, which in this scenario three, I think accounts to about 4 million rand, should have been negotiated and please must be negotiated beforehand. And then another little hidden cost that you would have forgotten about, but that the mile and you will point out is property transfer expenses. So the property transfer expenses for the, for the Apple Street property in South Africa is exactly the same that you will pay when you buy and sell properties now. Luckily, you don't pay transfer duty, which is the tax associated with the transfer of properties in a deceased estate scenario. 
But the big one here is the 4.5 million rand to transfer that Spanish house. In Spain, for example, and remember this differs from country to country dramatically, but in Spain, for example, the transfer costs is somewhere between 6% and 10%. And just for ease of, 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 of this exercise that we're doing this morning, we worked it out at 10%. And so the other big item on those costs of 9 million rand is 4.5 million rand just for property transfer expenses. Okay, so there we've got it. We've got 9 million rand of, of costs already that we've got to take into account. Then we've got to look at what is it that we have to pay. And now it's mounting up because yeah. uh, we have a loan to Joe from a trust of 45 million rand that has to be paid back and the accrual claim because the estate is so much bigger. Jane now has an accrual claim of 43 million. So before we've done anything, our 114 million, we've had to get rid of 90 million yeah. to pay these, these unforeseen or things that you weren't expecting. So just bear that in mind. We've had 9 million of costs and now we've got 89 million of, of loans, of accrual claims that have to be paid back. So going on to scenario three. Yeah, yes, I'm not like a Sorry, I can just add there that if you look at that, what you just said, this is a great example of we're guessing the maths totally failed Joe and his family. He thought he had a cake of 114 million rand to share. So he wanted to share left, right and center. And after all is said and done, he only has got 11 million, which makes a big difference. So that is where guessing these things really, really cannot benefit, any, benefit anyone. Okay, thanks, Sine. So what is actually left to give after taking off all the costs and the things you've got to pay? It's 15.7 million rand. And who gets what? So now here comes the biggest curveball. And so now I think you should run us through this because it's slightly complicated. It is, Diane. Let, let, let's just hope that I can keep you with me for a second because this is a very complicated um, solution that we have to come up with in circumstances like this. Um, but the, ideally, you and your family will never have to face this. But what happens is... Because of the forced airship regime in Spain, two thirds of the property in Spain, so that 45 million rand property, two thirds of it has to go to Joe's children, that's Sunny and Sally. Joe doesn't have any say in this. That is what the government of Spain says. And only one third of it can go to whoever he says in his will. Now remember in his will, he said, I leave everything to my wife. So, okay, great. Immediately, just there, we thought, everything to my wife, easy peasy, let's go. No, then Spain came in and said, wait a second, we've got to say. So, okay, we need to give the children, the two thirds of the 45 million rand is worth 30 million rand of the property. That is what we have to give Sunny and Sally, no questions asked. But remember, we only have the 15, almost 16, the 15.7 million rand to give. So because we have to give more than what we actually have, the heirs now have to abate their legacies. Abatement basically just means you have to remember this estate isn't insolvent. We've got assets that exceed liabilities by far. We don't have an insolvent estate here. We have an estate, but due to the working of the law, that is now the Spanish forced heirship, we have to give away more than what we actually have. So now, because we have to give that 30 million rand asset to the two children, but we only really have 15.7 million to give, the children now have to pay in. And that's where the abatement concept comes in. They have to abate their legacy to pay to reduce what they're getting so that we can bring that 30 million off to the 15.7. So they have to pay in. And then when it really, where it really gets quite sad is that... Um, What's an again? Jane. <laughs> Jane is there is still the residual in the will because the will said, I'll leave everything to Jane. And the residual heir is responsible to pay all the estate expenses. And remember, we just said the estate expenses, which includes all the liabilities and the costs and that fat accrual claim, amounts to about 90 million rand. So Jane is responsible to pay the 90 million rand and the children are walking off with the property in Spain. 
So the money that they pay in, that Sally and Sunny need to pay in, is just under 15 million rand to bring the difference in the two um, values closer together. They then pay that over to Jane so that to help her with the shortfall that she has to cover. And then at the end of the day, if she sells everything that she inherits, in other words, everything else, everything except the Spanish property. So that's the house in Apple Street. That's the share portfolio. That is the unit trust, the living annuity, everything. If she sells everything and she gets the 15 million from her children, then she's got exactly enough to cover the shortfall and actually walks out empty handed. There's a little bit of a silver, silver lining then. She still gets her accrual claim. Remember, they got married 20, 25, 30 years ago, and she negotiated that accrual claim. So she gets her accrual claim of 43 million, 45 million, um, but she had to sacrifice everything else. And then we know that because of how all of these expenses came into play, that this estate, which is a large estate of 114 million, at the end of the day, doesn't pay any estate duty. And immediately everyone around the table is going, wow, way to go. That seems, that's incredible. That's great. And it shouldn't be seen as a win because remember now we sit with 45 million rand in Jane's own hands that she now has to once again on another, at a second event pay estate duty on. The children all of a sudden had their estates grown with the Spanish property and they are going to work towards their lives and build. So now we're back again with a situation. We, we, yes, we didn't pay estate duty. Great. Perfect. This time around. But it's going to come back and catch us three other times. Um, so, yes, short term, short term victory, but maybe not the best for the family in the long run. Okay. Thanks, Ane. I think just the one other thing that it's important to point out is these user fracts and estates have a value. Yeah. And they do change the value of an estate. And that is the one reason, uh, and it's a calculation that's done based on Jane's mortality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's one of the reasons why there is no estate duty. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this is very complicated. There are lots of curveballs. And the advantage here is that we're working out what the curveballs are so that we can fix it. Mm -hmm. And so that these issues don't actually arise. And we're not saying don't go and buy properties in Spain. Oh, I mean, please do. One lives, one, one lives one's life and you are quite entitled to use your wealth for whatever you would like to do, but it does have consequences. And we just wanted to point that out to you. And structuring. Uh, and structuring yes. life, you buy those properties, buy them in a trust, there's different options. And once you have your eye on that perfect holiday home, just contact us and have a quick conversation. We can let you know where's the safest, most cost-effective way to buy it. So go and live your life, but just structure it correctly. And I think just on that point very quickly, because I know we're running out of time, we've only got one more slide to go, so it's not long. But, you know, there are lots of, we talked about family and issues, and a lot of you may have, or some of you may have uh, heirs who are going to inherit in the States, United States. It's a problem if you've got a trust. <clears throat> Excuse me. But there are ways to get around that. There's always a solution. So please, please, if you've got those kind of issues, we've learned an awful lot over the, how long have we been here now, Kat? over the 30 years, uh, and we can certainly assist you and look at what your particular issues are. And also now we've got clients that are global, so it's become more and more pertinent to be aware of all the issues. So Sine is now going to move on, and she's going to tell us who needs a My l and account. I'm going to bow out. My bit of this is finished, so I'm going to say thank you very much for listening, and Kate is going to finish off for us. So off you go, Sine, here you go. Ta -da. Thank you so much, Di. So yes, who needs a my l &D? First of all, if you have assets and you have people that you love, that you want to take care of and that you want to make life easier for in the future, you need a my l &D. Everyone needs a my l &D. That's a fact. But there are those people that it's really just not negotiable. It really, really isn't. It's a must have. And if that is, if any of the following is present in your life, if you are married in community of property for the reasons that we discussed earlier, if you are married out of community of property with the accrual system, 
if you have a blended family, it's a, it's a second marriage and you've got yours, mine and ours children, then definitely that needs to be taken into account. If you've got children or heirs abroad, any assets abroad or trusts abroad, if you've got a business and a business partner that you also need to take into consideration, if you've got loan accounts from companies or trusts or wherever they come from, needs to be taken into account because they do form part of either an asset or a liability in your estate. And then, of course, um, if you have assets, like many of our clients have large fixed property portfolios, so you can have a large estate, but really not much liquidity in it to take care of all these items that we've touched on this morning. If you if you sit in your chair, one of those people, you have to, have to, have to make contact with us as soon as possible so that we can navigate through these things as it fits your family and your scenario in, in the unique way that it does. Thank you so much, Kate. Great. Thank you, Diane Sine. I'm sure everyone found it very interesting. Speaking from experience, very simple in estates in South Africa can take up to two years to be wound up completely. By utilizing the My l and and rectifying these issues before you pass away, you can reduce the time spent on having your estate wound up to possibly a year or six months, as well as saving on spending money unnecessarily on fees and hidden costs. As each of your circumstances are different and very specific, we unfortunately won't be able to answer questions today. But if you have any questions or queries that you'd like to run past us, please get in touch with us on the contact details provided. Um, this presentation has also been recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel shortly. Um, we can also email it to you if you need. So we hope you enjoyed it and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, everyone.